Grab your Bibles, go to 1 Peter, the fifth chapter. I'm starting a series today. It's going to be this week and next week. And it's going to be about the devil. It's going to be, do you know hell's talked about more than heaven in the Bible? There, there's warnings. A, a huge part of your walk with God are the warnings of God. He doesn't want you to be ignorant of Satan's devices. And so it says in the Bible, it says, we are, Paul told the church, he said, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. They weren't ignorant of Satan's devices because they had been in church. When you first get in church, you are ignorant of Satan's devices. And so the preacher has to say, hey, 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 that's something Satan uses. That's tricks and schemes that Satan uses to destroy your family, to destroy your ministry, and to destroy your life. And so he has to be exposed. So I want to take two weeks and just expose the devil for everything he's doing and then claim victory in the name of Jesus over all of our lives because we do have victory in Jesus. But there are times in your fight with God where you're like, God, where are you? Lord, I feel helpless. I feel like Satan is winning in my life. And I want to make you a promise right now. If you're going through a rough patch and you're just a little discouraged, I want you to know, stay faithful to God because God's faithful people are promised that God will always come through for them and he'll never leave or forsake them. So whatever pain, suffering, and loss you're experiencing right now, it's only temporary because you're a child of God and God always comes through for his people. How many of you know weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning? I need somebody to lay claim to that in Jesus' name. So I'm going to read this scripture to you. I know you've been standing for a while, and if your ankles are swollen, you can be seated. But if the rest of you can handle it, I want you to, to get into this word. This is one of my favorite chapters. I go to this chapter to remind myself what kind of pastor I want to be and what kind of person I want to be. And sometimes I got to remind myself. But this is actually not just for pastors. This is for all of us. And so I want to read it to you. It says, the elders which are among you, I exhort. How many elders do we have in here? You all think you're young, huh? Okay. <laughs> the elders were the people who were seasoned in the things of God. So it's not just being old. Some people are just old. An elder is something different. An elder is a seasoned follower of Jesus where they bear fruit in their life. Their life should tell you they have lived for the Lord for a long time. And they, they play a, an important role in this church. And Peter said, I also am an elder. He was in his 60s and served God faithfully. And a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God, which is among you. Feed the sheep. Taking the oversight thereof, not by force or constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, not for money, but for a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Meaning that the way we lead in God's church is not through authority and bullying people, but through service and love. It doesn't mean you don't correct, but you do it from a place of love and service not, not like worldly people do. We're, in other words, we don't need a bunch of bosses. We need elders. We need people who love us. Aren't you glad that somebody who was a little further along in their journey came to you and helped you out in your journey? That's the value of eldership. And when the chief shepherd, that's Jesus, shall appear, you'll receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, all the younger people, raise your hands. Okay, yeah, all right. Now everybody's raising their hands. <laughs> younger, submit to the older. That's a part of God's ways. It's one of the cool, it's one of the few advantages of getting older is you get to be the boss of the younger people, but in a godly bossy way. But it's one of the few advantages. But the younger you're asked to submit. Now watch this. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. Now wait a minute. 
You're saying God has this plan where you're submitted to people over you, but you're also submitted to people on side of you? Yes. It's to protect you. And we're going to get into why, but let me show you how first. All of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. There it is. Why? Because God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober. It means be ready. Watch. Be vigilant. Be prepared. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, is, wa is walking about, seeking who he may devour. He wants your life for lunch. He wants to destroy and kill everything in your life that is good. He is hungry for your life. Is your life food for God or food for Satan? Because the lion is walking around here right now. The Satan is walking around seeing who, who's, who's vulnerable to him. And see, Satan doesn't look at our phony facade. He's looking for disobedience because sin is Satan's food. And it's what he preys on. He looks for those weak and vulnerable and offended and hurt and struggling. And so what we do is we get in the church and we come under God and we come under his leadership and we come under one another. And now we're safe when we struggle because when two people walk together, when one falls, the other one picks them up. And then when they fall, the other one picks that one up. You're not going to go through this journey without stumbling. But if you're in the church, there'll always be somebody there to pick you up. You got to stay in the house of God. So who resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Knowing that the same sufferings you're going through, people are going through all over the world. You think you're the only one having problems at home. You think you're the only one struggling in your mind. You think you're the only one being attacked at the job. You're not the only one. We're all going through this. We're all going through this. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, makes you perfect, established, strengthens, and settles you. But you got to get to your after. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now there's a structure to this where God is trying to protect you from your adversary, the devil. He's given you the authority of the church and the disposition in which keeps you safe and growing in God. And if you're like me, sometimes that's hard. Humility, submission, not giving in to the tricks and schemes of the devil, it can be difficult. But I don't want you to fall for that. I don't want you to fall to his schemes, to his tricks. He knows your vulnerability. And I don't want you to fall to it. So I'm going to pray for you. My subject today is don't fall for that. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that you purify our hearts. Let us hear what you're saying in the spirit, God. May our flesh not turn off your words because maybe we think we know them already. Or maybe we think we do them already. May us really hear in the spirit what you're saying to each one of us. Individually and as a church. And God, may you do powerful things. Because God, I know there are people in this room who need to be filled with your spirit. Who need to be delivered. And who need your power to rule and reign in their life. I pray it happen. And we rebuke the devil as we resist to you, Jesus. We rebuke the devil in Jesus' name. And he has to flee according to your word. And the church said, amen. 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 Look at your neighbor and say, don't fall for that. That's a trick of the devil trying to get you out of the church. You may be seated. God gave us eldership. He gave us elders to help us rule the church and the body. We have a lot of elders here with people who, they came to the nine o'clock, all the younger people slept in. But we do have some elders in this church and in this, class, in this particular service. There's some people in here right now, they'll help you. They'll teach you things because elders have been through something. 
Brother Freddie and Sister Loretta, they've been through something. And it is so good to see them, by the way. They, they lost a lot of their home. They were in Texas, but God called them back home. Come on, somebody. I'm so glad they're here. I love them so much. They've been through it. They've been through everything you can think of. They've been through it. Sister Loretta has had to endure arguments with Brother Freddie. I'm almost sure of it. There's probably been at least once or twice in their marriage, Brother Freddie was wrong. And Sister Loretta still worship God. That's the value. But they'll tell you, they'll tell you the truth because somebody who's been down the road this long and is still here, they have value in the kingdom of God. And so if you've been through something and you're thinking you're not going to make it, you need to go to an elder and say, tell me how to do it. Tell me how to pray. And they're going to tell you. Sister B's going to tell you, sweetheart, you got to seek the Lord. You got to pray. You got to come to church. Stop missing church. They're going to tell you that. Because elders will help you. They'll tell you, cover that up, sweetheart. You don't need to be showing that. That, that, that canal was meant to be covered. <laughs> Thighs are only good at Popeye's. <laughs> elders will tell you that stuff. They'll tell that young man, hey, buddy, you got to calm down. The way you're talking to your life, your wife is very aggressive. That's not godly. You love her. It's okay if you express yourself, but don't be so angry. Young man, an elder will tell you that. He'll come to you and say, young man, you got a shmedium on. You're extra large. Go ahead and put that on. You're showing everybody everything. Because our society is going to teach you to flaunt your body, to explore sexually, that, but the elders will come in. Elders don't care. You reach a certain age where you don't care anymore. That's right. That's right. When you're young, you care about everything. How does this look? Is this okay? Old people are like, I don't care. I'm getting pretty close to that age. I ain't going to lie. I'm not old, but I'm getting close to that age. Every now and then, I got to remind myself to fix my hair before I leave my house. I just don't care anymore. Used to spend forever in front of the mirror. Now I don't want to look at it. Elders are like that. They're past all that vanity. Y'all know what I'm talking about? How many of you pass all that silly stuff? You want to live for God. You don't care what it looks like. Young, young people, listen to your elders because it's a structure and a system that protects the church and keeps everybody together. And what the enemy's trying to do is get you out. And I know I've been preaching a lot about it, but that's what's happening. Is the enemy's trying to get you out, but that's the trick of Satan. And so... Peter's trying to teach them here, feed the flock, elders, feed them, teach them, teach people, pour out of your life. You're, you, you have to pour out because if you don't empty your cup, your waters get stagnant. If you're getting bored with church, if you don't feel God, you got to start pouring into others' lives. Get that water moving because waters that don't move become stagnant and there's no life in them. All the life in the water begins to die. But any water that flows has oxygen in it and it produces life. And God's saying, get your waters moving. Pour out. Teach somebody the word of God. Teach somebody. Help somebody. Love somebody. Pour into somebody. It's, it, it's such a beautiful thing. One of the best things that ever happened to my life was I began to help others the best I could. And it seems like the more I helped others, the more God helped me. But what you learn is when you help others in the kingdom of God, you got to be humble. You can't, you can't walk around like you own, you know, like, like, like you bought property in heaven or something. You have to be submitted. It's through humility. Jesus said, don't be like the Gentiles who, who are Lord over, God, over the heritage, who, who boss people around and who are aggressive and are out for their own profit. You've got to serve. And whoever serves in the kingdom, you're the greatest in the kingdom. But you got to serve. But what does that take? It takes humility. Yeah. Because he's warning you. He's leading up to the point that Satan is looking for someone he can devour. Which means that there is a certain condition you can be where Satan has access to you. And there's a certain condition you can be in where Satan has no access to you. And so he's walking around looking because he doesn't get to just attack whoever he wants. He doesn't get to end your ministry if he doesn't want to. He doesn't get to put cancer on you and, and kill you with it unless he's allowed. 
He doesn't get to put, he doesn't get to end your marriage and divorce unless he's allowed. He doesn't have that kind of access. So he's looking to see if anybody will give him access. And so he's listening to your conversations. I feel the Holy Ghost. He's listening to what you say. And every time you say, I just don't think I can make it. He's like, we got one. Hey, imps, demons, all of you, come here, come here. Come on, leave all those pop stars alone. Come here, we've got a complainer. I need you to come over here. They just said, I thought we couldn't get them. They were part of house prayer. Yeah, but I think we got them. I think we got them. I just heard them talk about Brother Josh. I just heard them. They got offended by the leader in their department. I think we got them now. They think they're right, and they think because their feelings are hurt, they can just say whatever they want. Come on. Come on, come out of the ditches. We got one. We got this one. This. What's going on? What you want, Satan? No. What you want, Satan? <laughs> We've got one. How, how do you know? Because they're not going to church anymore. And I know that when they leave the herd, we can get them. I've seen this thousands of times over the years. We got one. And Satan's just roaming your families, roaming your children, seeing what you talk about in the home, seeing what you do in your spare time, seeing if mom and dad are reading their Bibles and praying over their children, seeing if love is exchanged, seeing if people are spreading the gospel. They're looking for people who are vulnerable to their devour. Satan is looking at your life and he's saying, let me see what you do when nobody's looking. Let me... Give me your phone. Let me see if I can eat your life to death. We got them. Y'all worried about Google and y'all worried about Apple. Y'all need to worry, be worried about the devil. Y'all worried about the government. You need to be worried about the devil. And you need to reclaim your family, reclaim your private life in the name of Jesus. We belong to God. Get your life right. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Let me tell you something. Satan will make you think because you struggle with something that you can't come out of it. And so what he does is he says something to you in the spirit world. I'm going to show you how this works. I know the Lord's speaking to me right now. He says in the whole armor of God in Ephesians 6, he says you've got to put on the whole armor of God. Do you, do you remember why he said you've got to put on the whole armor of God? So that you don't succumb to the schemes or wiles of the devil. Now watch this. I'm going somewhere. He said, you have to quench the fiery darts of the enemy through the shield of faith. How many of you have seen a dart? I've never seen a fiery dart. That would be so weird if you were just laying in your bedroom one day and you just saw a dart. I have never seen one. So if there are fiery darts that the enemy is shooting, he's seeing what will stick because he doesn't know what's in your mind until you open your mouth. And so he shoots a thought at you and he watches. And so you know what you've been going through. You know money's been tight. You know your feelings got hurt. You know you've been struggling in your prayer life. You know that you've been fighting with your, with your brother or your sister or your spouse or your child's been acting up or church has been dry for you or ministry hasn't taken off or he knows you're tired or they know they've been persecuting you on the job. He knows, so he shot a, a flaming dart and he sat around to see. And so what he does is he knows you're vulnerable, so he shoots a dart in the spirit, because it's not physical. Right, right, yeah. So he shoots this thought and he says, you're not going to make it. And he sits back to see what you say. Because he doesn't know whether you have faith in God or whether you have doubt. So he's waiting to see what you say after he shoots his dart. So now you lost your job, 
you're struggling financially, the kids are acting up, you're struggling in your marriage, you're feeling depressed, you're feeling sad, you've been hit with disappointment, and there he is waiting, and then you say something like, I can't wait for church Sunday. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait to lift my hands and praise God. He's like, And then you start saying things like, no weapon formed against me is going to be able to prosper. You're letting them know, you shot it, but I didn't get hit with it. I have faith in God. I wish everybody would just take a praise break. No matter what's going on, put some faith on it. I trust you, God. I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. So you got to be shielded in the house. There's always that, that sheep that thinks it's better off on its own. That's a trap. Look, this is not a perfect church. I'm not a perfect pastor. The departments are not perfect. But I promise you, if you get out from under the covering of the church, Satan will have access to your life. The word of God says, don't forsake the assembling of the brethren together. Yeah. It says, don't miss the gathering, especially as we're getting closer to the end. Yeah. That's what it's saying. Yeah. Why? Because he was prophesying, he was warning us that in the end, there would be a move by Satan to get you isolated by yourself out from the gathering. Because there's something about somebody else fighting for you. I feel the Holy Ghost. I can't tell you how many times I went to bed discouraged, beat up as a pastor, wondering if I'll be able to protect the sheep. But I woke up refreshed because somebody somewhere must have got on their knees and said, God, help pastor today. God, strengthen him today. Give him courage, God. Give him faith, God. And you don't know how many times I've prayed for you and how many times your brothers and sisters pray for you. We got to stay together. Shout yes. yes. And so it talks about submission because submission is the symbol of humility. And that's, you see it in marriage, you see it in the church. Submission is not an easy thing. It's not. In fact, submission only exist when there is some form, of, some form of a disagreement. Like if you said, Josh, let's eat a roast beef po' boy. I wouldn't be like, well, I need to submit to that. I'd be like, yeah, we're just in agreement. We're just in agreement that roast beef po' boys are good. If you say, let's have a crawfish ball. I'm not like, well, I'm going to submit. You know? But it, there are things I disagree with. That's where submission is challenged. And you do what is right, even if you don't want to do it. And so the Bible tells the wife to be a symbol of this in a marriage because she represents the church. Ladies, you're symbolically a representative of the church. <laughs> I got a few people excited, not very many. So you represent the church. So the way you behave to your husband should be a reflection of how the church should behave to God. And so you submit to the husband even when he's wrong. <laughs> Not even the single people are amen at me at this point. So why submit? Do you know him, God? It's hard sometimes, but there are times when it's easier, but when it's harder, you do it as unto the Lord. And so you do what's right because God asked you to fulfill that role. Why? Because it protects the home and brings order to the home. I'm not trying to get you to, I'm not trying to build this church on a bunch of women who just say, yes, sir, and, and do whatever their husbands ask them to do and let the men walk around all macho and dominant and all that good stuff. That's not what I'm doing. I'm trying to protect the home because where mama's not submitting to daddy, the devil can rule and reign. We got to get the women in submission to the husbands. <laughs> Guys, you didn't think you were going home scot-free, did you? 
God commanded the man to love the wife as Christ loved the church. And I'm going to be honest, guys. Some of the reason our women don't follow us is because we're not following God. And we got to love the woman. Jesus didn't say, whenever the church gets right, I'm going to get on this cross. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Meaning that he got on the cross when we were wrong. Which means he gave of himself even though we were wrong. So guys, the excuse that our wives aren't what they need to be so you're not loving them is not a godly argument. You love her even when she's wrong. You give her attention even when she's wrong. You stay with her even when she's wrong. You provide for her even when she's wrong. And you don't go around bad-mouthing her with all the other heathens who are bad-mouthing their wives because you're supposed to be under the protection of Jesus Christ and Satan is waiting to see what you say with your mouth. Ladies, look at your husbands right now and say, watch your mouth. Nobody said it, you bunch of chickens. I thought y'all would love that part. I thought all the girls put their hand on their head. You watch your mouth. You do have to watch your mouth. Watch your mouth, ladies. Watch your mouth. Because your mouth is telling Satan what you believe. And so you might have had a bad week in your marriage, but when you go to work, you boast on your spouse and the goodness of the Lord because you're letting Satan know, not today, buddy. You didn't win. And this is what I felt in the, sp- in the spirit is that humility, if some of you would come under humility, you would submit and you would be safe. But our pride is causing us to lift ourselves up and it's causing us to come into danger. And so there's submission to authority and each other. And this is what he says. He says, humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Now, look how that sounds. Submit under the hand of God. When you first come to God, that's how it feels sometimes. Like, what do you mean I can't get drunk? What do you mean? Well, the Bible talks about that. It talks about drinking strong drink, being under the influence of alcohol. The Bible talks about all that. The Bible talks about you being a royal priest, and the priest could not drink when they were serving in ministry. And you're supposed to be serving in ministry 24-7. And so at first, if it's like the hand of God, can't have sex outside of marriage, can't have homosexual relationships, all is sin, can't be effeminate, you can't lie, you can't harm people with violence, hand of God, that's how it feels. You come in a church, you can't live together if you're not married, hand of God. Sometimes I preach and you're like, ugh. But watch what, if you could humble yourself and say, God, if this is what you want, I'm going to do my best. He says, if you submit and you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, this becomes this. And he says, if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, he will lift you up. Now, what used to feel like oppression now becomes an elevator into greatness. But you got to be willing to submit. And God, when he tells you something hard, it's for your benefit. God doesn't, God is not cruel to his people. He's kind and loving. He's looking out for you. So when he tells you not to do something or do something, it's to protect you. But what happens is we get offended and we get hurt. And then we come out from the protection of God's word and God's church. And because of those offenses, We become Satan's prey. And he's roaming this whole area, seeing who he can devour through offense. I found a scripture for you, and I didn't give this to the first service, so put some extra in the offering. (laughs) Second Corinthians, the second chapter, verses five through 11, go look at it. It links forgiveness 
to not allowing Satan to outwit you, to outsmart you. Meaning that if you have unforgiveness, you fall prey to his craftiness. And so what he's done is he's taking the cruelty of others to ruin you. He's taken the mistakes of someone else to destroy your own faith in God and your faith in the church. Because he's simply trying to outwit you. To get you to analyze situations and relationships to the point of not believing in God's word and God's church. And it's just something to get you and attack you. It's the spirit of offense. But the hand of God is coming to some of you. And he's going to provide for you and he's going to help for you and he's going to expose. He's going to turn the light on, on the devil and he's going to be caught in the act of sneaking in your home, sneaking in your mind and tormenting your relationships. You're going to flick the light of God's word and God's spirit on and when that light comes on, Satan's going to scatter like a roach caught with the light on. He's got to go. He's got to go. And I feel like some of us have allowed Satan to come in and through sin trying to take over and I don't want you to fall for that. I don't want you to fall into sin and I don't want you to fall into shame and condemnation. I want to read a scripture. It's in 1 John 3 verse 8. It says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of Man was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil, meaning the whole reason Jesus came was to destroy the works of the devil. Sin allows Satan to work in your life. And so here you are and you're like thinking God's mad at you when really God just wants you to submit and surrender. And there may be some things in your life that you're struggling to give to God. You're struggling. You're like, God, I, I don't feel like I can give that up. I don't feel like I can give you my life. I don't feel like I can come to church every Sunday. I don't feel like I can do this, but do that. That's all just Satan just playing with your mind. You're giving in to him, losing your way. Can someone make you mad enough to poorly represent Jesus? I've been thinking about that lately. I'm like, God, am I unoffendable? As a pastor, you get your feelings hurt a little bit. Am I unoffendable? God, do I excuse my bad attitudes because of someone else's behavior? Because that's the works of the devil. And the works of the devil is to get in your mind. You ever had a repeating thought playing in your mind that kept wearing you down? Yeah. Where do you think that comes from? That didn't come from God. You ever belittled somebody because they got on your nerves? Do you think that was God? Or was that the dark? Because what I think is going on right now is we have an opportunity as a church. We can buy into the race war. We can buy into the political war. We can buy into the pandemic war. Mass, no mass, vaccine, no vaccine. CNN, Fox. Left, right. <laughs> or we could say, Jesus, your word, your spirit, your church. Because I believe you're being tormented through darts, just wearing you out. Yeah, yeah. And I need you to stop using your mouth as a weapon for Satan and start using your mouth as a weapon for God. Because when you begin to speak God's word, you begin to speak your faith and look, you won't see it. You just got to believe it. You know, God told me that there would be a church in Thibodeau, Louisiana of 7,000 people then the pandemic hit then the pandemic hit again and again and again then Ida hit I just want to remind you 
there will be a church. 7,000 people in this city. There will be. If God told you you're going to minister to people and help them, speak it. You say, but my marriage fell apart. Speak your faith. But I'm discouraged. Speak your faith. Because your mouth is the weapon that decides who owns your heart. It testifies of who will win. Henry Ford said, the man who thinks he can and the man who thinks he can't are both right. I think there's some biblical truth to that. The person who chooses to believe God's power and his word will win. The, pe- the person who does not believe it will lose. It's up to you. You have a choice. Would you stand on your feet? And so I came to expose the devil because he's using the spirit of offense. He's using your suffering to get you to speak against the things of God. He's getting you to complain so that you just testify of the goodness of Satan. But what if we just change that right now and testified of the goodness of God? I would have fainted had I not seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Remember that scripture last week? I would have drawn back and quit, but I've seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I feel like God is convicting some hearts. He wants to give you victory. I don't want you to fall for that. Satan is using pain to get you to surrender your life to him. But God says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Cast your cares on me because I care for you. That's what Jesus is saying. Throw your cares at me. I'll care for you. I'll love you. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? I feel like somebody needs some victory in here today. And we're going to claim victory with you and for you. If you need victory in your mind, especially. If you just have felt some angst and some torment, I want you to come up to the front right now. I feel like God wants to really heal your spirit and give you deliverance and healing and health. It is not the will of God that you go any further in this pain and suffering, in this doubt, fear, and anxiety. Come on. 